moving now to the uh, second presentation around um, production of hydrogen via nuclear means. And um, Rebecca Rosling, who is head of R&D at Smart Customers, part of EDF Energy, um, joined me earlier in the year in February, Rebecca, and thank you for joining again. And we're, we're really interested with the, the release of the hydrogen strategy on the role of nuclear in hydrogen. So I'm thinking that you're going to tell us a little bit about how that works when you bring up your presentation. And we'll have a panel later with um, Neil and Stephen. So if we'd like to take the floor and put your presentation up, we should be able to... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry Just, about that. <laughs> um, it's the technology I, that is. I it's think coming. I might have shared the wrong screen, which is uh, inevitable, I suppose. Let's try this one. Let's try that Isn't one. It? There we go. There we go. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see that. We can. You're, you have the floor. Great. Um, so thank you very much, um, Paul, for the invitation. So um, I suppose what, what I'm going to do is talk a little, talk about the nuclear hydrogen, I think building on, on some of the points that, that Neil's just made, um, but also kind of try and put it in a, a wider context of the, um, the ambitions of a kind of a, a, a broad energy player like, like EDF. So um, I'll start with just introducing who, who EDF are. Um, so EDF in the, the UK in particular. So um, EDF is, is part of a very large group, which is the EDF group, which is um, prim primarily based in France, but we're, we're also quite large in the UK. So um, our, our goal, we, we, we re, re, uh, redefined our mission earlier uh, last year, I think, or earlier this year, um, that our goal is to help Britain achieve net zero. So it's really at the heart of everything that we do. So we, we want to help Britain achieve net zero by leading the transition to a cleaner, low emission, um, primarily electric future and tackle climate change. So at the moment, we're the UK's largest producer of low carbon electricity from nuclear, um, solar, wind and, and also batteries, um, we also, which meets about a fifth of the, the country's demand. And we also supply millions of customers with, with electricity and gas um, across all sectors, really, for electricity, definitely domestic, but also some of the largest ions, um, industrial, commercial and everything in between, really. Um, so if I move on to going into that in a little bit more detail, sorry, I'm just trying to work out to change slides. Um, so and to put it a little bit in the context of hydrogen. So this is a little bit more about our, our business units and this is um, Kind of a graphic that our comms team put together to introduce EDF as a whole but when, when I started thinking about it a few months ago I realized that hydrogen is relevant to pretty much every every part of the business so um, I'm just going to go round the house of cards from from left to right so I start with our, our generation business so that's the literally the, the keeping the lights on business so that's um, the business that's um, dedicated to operating with the UK's nuclear operator so we operate low carbon nuclear generation and we also have um, a one legacy coal station that's remaining that, that will close in a year's time. Um, and also big focus in that business on, on shifting to the, the decommissioning uh, responsibilities. I don't know how aware you all are, but of our existing nuclear fleet, only Sizewell B will be generating at, at the end of this decade in all probability. So it's a huge period of transition for that, that part of the business. And I think what, what they've realized um, and, you know, they're doing a lot of work on that, that transformation and that strategy. And I think what, what's becoming increasingly clear is that the hydrogen is a real opportunity for some of those sites. So both the nuclear sites and also the, the, the coal sites that will be decommissioned. Those are, those are sites that you could put new power stations on or you could put something, you know, some kind of energy hub where you combine nuclear. Um, so you combine electricity production from all sorts of source, zero carbon sources with um, the hydrogen production and you know, you've got the, the grid connections, you can have batteries. So I think that there's a real open open piece of paper, sorry, blank sheet of paper for, for quite a lot of those sites. Um, at the same time, we are we have got some sites that are, are much more further developed in that, that road of, of um, refreshing. Um, one is the, oh, excuse me, I'm trying to get rid of that. Um, one is the uh, the nuclear construction that we're currently doing at Hinkley Point C. Um, most of you will be aware of that. That's going to be 3.2 gigawatts of um, zero carbon generation. On that that site's progressing well. 
Um, and I think what's what's interesting about it is when I move to the next card, which is, is nuclear development, which is developing the next nuclear project after Hinkley Point C. Um, so in all, all probability, that will be that will be size well C. That's what we're trying very hard to develop. And I think where obviously HPC started several years ago, as we'll see, we've, we've got a bit more flexibility to consider how hydrogen can pay a part of that construction project. Um, and there's, there's a, I think, a few ways that, that I'll come on to a bit later there. Um, the, ne the next card is the renewable card. I think the, I'm sure that over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of discussion about the role of renewables to produce hydrogen. Um, and I think we were certainly, although we are, you know, we are, Britain's nuclear operator, we are also very committed to renewable generation as well. We see them as, as complementary, not competitors, I suppose. So we are um, we're definitely looking at how hydrogen can play a role in supporting new renewable projects getting off the ground, um, supporting, uh, complementing maybe batteries. So the kind of short term storage you get from batteries, maybe with the longer term uses of, of hydrogen. And I think that's that's a field that's going to grow and grow over the next few years. Um, I suppose the, the right hand side of the, this kind of deck of cards is more on the, the customer facing side. So if I, I start with Imtech, that's our energy services company. So that's um, developing um, uh, solutions for, for energy centers and that kind of thing. So energy solutions for, um, for industrial customers. So Imtech may be doing building fit out or building management or Breathe, which is another subsidiary of Imtech, will do um, Kind of retrofit work, I suppose, um, and that they they have they I'm 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 underselling what they do, but in tech do a lot of work with customers, and clearly all industrial customers they they want to have a a, a net zero project, and clearly um, hydrogen is going to play part of that, I'm sure. Um, the, the next card on here is is electric mobility, um, and I think if I rebrand that to zero carbon mobility. I think that's another area that, that's really growing for hydrogen in EDF. And I'll talk a bit more about one of the projects we've got there. And last but not least, um, the, the customer business that I kind of put at the, it's really at the heart of everything we do. But I think that that card really goes, the, the, this, this graphic goes through the kind of the, the lifetime of an electron almost. But um, clearly the customer's business is, is very much in the news at the moment. There's the supply businesses. It's uh, I think it's been a long time since um, we found ourselves quoting quite so many headlines as we have in the last week or two. But I think it's really shone a light on um, uh, on how dependent the country is on gas and how that that can't continue because it's not it's not good for the climate and it's not good for for customers. It's not good for supplies. It's not good for anyone. The current situation isn't isn't sustainable. That, that dependence we have on, on gas, both for producing electricity, but even more important for, for heating our homes and so on. Um, I don't, I think, I think electricity is clearly going to play a big part in all of those, but we also know clearly that, and I'm preaching to the converted in this audience, that there will be some, some end uses, particularly in industrial and heavy mobility settings where, where in order to decarbonize their, their, um, the activities, our customers will, will need to use hydrogen as well as electricity. And we, we really see ourselves as the partner for those customers to support them in decarbonizing and decarbonizing in the way that's right for them. We, we are an electricity company. Electricity is at the heart of everything we do. Um, but we're not, we're not there to, um, to push that solution. We, we, we believe it will be the right solution in, for many, many, um, current uh, emissions, reducing many emissions, but it won't, it won't be the solution for absolutely everything. Um, so, so far, so much for, for EDF as a whole. And then I just wanted to talk perhaps in two, two sections, really. Um, I, won't, I won't go through this slide in detail, but I suppose this is, this is a different presentation, really, of what I've talked about. So showing how all the bits of our business are doing things in order to um, support electrolytic hydrogen in the UK. Um, the one bit that I didn't mention on the previous slide, and I should have done, is, is Hynamics. So Hynamics is currently a it's a subsidiary of our French parent, um, and it is a an end to end producer of low carbon hydrogen solutions. So their their business model in France is relatively straightforward, um, perhaps, which is that at a basic level they install electrolyzers on customer sites. Um, and because the grid in France is decarbonized due to their hugely successful kind of nuclear program from over the last what, 50, 60 years, 
um, any any place you put an electrolyzer, you're automatically producing zero carbon electricity and um, zero carbon hydrogen. That's clearly not the case in the UK. So in the UK, it's very important that when we develop electrolytic hydrogen projects, we um, we couple them with both either renewables or nuclear. Um, so dynamics are, are growing in the UK at the moment. Um, and I think we were, I'm sure if I was to do this presentation in a year's time, I'll have several projects that they've done that, that I think would be really interesting to this audience. Um, I think another big area of focus for them, they've had a lot of success in, in Germany as well on um, ammonia projects and other kind of hydrogen derivatives that will also clearly be part of that, that net zero future. Um, so then for the second part of my presentation, I just wanted to talk a little bit, probably building on what, what Neil said. So I wanted to talk in a bit more detail about the two projects we've done already about producing hydrogen from nuclear um, and talk a bit about some of the plans we've got at the moment. And then just to really emphasize that message that that and I think there's been some discussion about the, the chicken and egg problem already this morning, that we we, we feel that, um, so I want to talk a bit about the end uses as well, because I think you, if, if you focus very narrowly on either um, demand, uh, you know, end uses of hydrogen or on production of hydrogen, I think you put a lot of weight on government or other kind of infrastructure providers to, to join the dots. So that, that's why as, as EDF, we think it's quite important, particularly at this early stage to, to make that push by del delivering these integrated projects, which perhaps explains why we're, we're really attacking it from both sides, both the production and the, and the demand. Um, so to start with, with um, the nuclear story then, which started for us probably um, 2018, um, which was when we first got funding for the Hydrogen Tahitian project, which was under the government's first hydrogen supply project um, competition. So Hisham, we've got two nuclear power stations at Hisham, um, Hisham 1 and Hisham 2, imaginatively called, um, and they're AGR stations. So um, the, the, so they will, as I said earlier, they, they will both be closed at the end of the decade, but at least one of them um, should be towards the end of the decade. And um, it's in quite an industrial area um, in, in, in the, the northwest. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that it's really Sorry, I don't know how to get rid of some of these uh, these notifications appearing, but none of them are very interesting, I'm sure. Um, it's a it's a good industrial area. It's also very con well connected with the port, with local residents, and with the local transport network, which is really key: rail, road, and sea. So what you can see in this this nice picture is you can see the two nuclear stations next to each other. That's the kind of these big boxes, um, and you can see the kind of something about the setting of where they are. So the the vision that we had three years ago, was to um, connect an electrolyzer to the Hesham plant. Um, and the key innovation there was, was doing that first go at co-locating of electrolysis and nuclear. So to generate hydrogen using low carbon um, nuclear, to try and improve the kind of the perceived flexibility and the actual flexibility of nuclear, to really develop a business case for production of electrolytic hydrogen, to explore local demand for hydrogen, uh, we also plan to use the byproduct. So obviously, when you, when you split water into hydrogen and oxygen, you also produce oxygen. Oxygen is used on nuclear sites anyway. So we found that a useful kind of um, a way of slightly um, improving the business case. Um, and then also importantly, and clearly government wouldn't have funded this if it wasn't also just to set us on a path for replicating across across the rest of our, our fleet of nuclear and renewable sites. Um, so this was this was what the, the system proposal was. So compared to some of the slides you've seen this morning, this is not the most technical. Um, but the idea was to have two one megawatt electrolyzers on the site. So one one PEM and one alkaline. Um, and I think by, by having both, we wanted to really explore as part of the piece of the um, demonstrations chain um, stage, the uh, the kind of the relative, how, how flexible, how efficient, how the two work together. And to kind of explore that that kind of integration. Um, we're also going to have a refueling station on the site. Um, there would be storage and cylinders and tube trailers on the site. Um, and the idea was to produce around 800 kilograms every day. Um, and then this is a nice little nice little uh, uh, mock-up of what it would look like. So you can see the nuclear stations that you saw from the air in the background. Um, that kind of fence there 
is the, the actual boundary of the licensed site. So the goal was to have it very close, as you can see from this picture, to the nuclear site, um, but not actually on the, on the regulated site. So oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so just before I wrap up on H2, perhaps I'll, I'll finish what, what happened. So we did a very successful technical feasibility study. It, uh, we, we addressed a lot of the initial kind of safety concerns of, of storing hydrogen so close to a nuclear site, albeit, I have to confess, in, in relatively small quantities. Um, we found a lot of a lot of local interest. A lot of people were really interested in, in buying the hydrogen that we produce. Um, I think the, the real challenge, and um, you know, government is clearly acutely aware of this, which is, um, informs a lot of the hydrogen strategy that they, they've just released. Um, we, we couldn't produce the hydrogen at the cost that consumers were willing to pay. So, you know, at the time, there were very few end user incentives. Nuclear hydrogen is not currently um, eligible for the renewable transport fuel obligation that, that incentivizes, um, among other renewable fuels, um, electrolytic hydrogen, um, which, uh, which would have perhaps made it commercially viable for, um, for, for transport operators. But without that subsidy or any other subsidies, um, we, 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 were, we were way off what customers were willing to pay. So um, we, we didn't progress to the phase two, the demonstrator. But I think the learnings from this project, both on the, the carbon footprint of the, of the hydrogen we would have produced, the technical feasibility and the cost have been really useful for, for government and has really um, set us on a, on a footing, I suppose, to, to, to take the next steps. Um, so building on the, the H2H project, what, what are the next steps for us? So the main, the first thing probably we did, which was around a year ago or a year and a half ago, was to start looking, as I touched on earlier and Neil talked about, it, um, the potential for size well C. So there's an, a nice little graphic on the left there that shows how at the moment what a nuclear plant does is um, it produces electricity that goes to the electricity network. So that kind of dark blue arrow there that hopefully you can see my, um, my cursor on. But actually, it could do a lot more. Um, one thing, obviously, that's relatively straightforward is that you can use the electricity to, to, um, to power things on site, which can you know, potentially reduce the, the need for grid requirement, um, grid reinforcement, and can, can change the, the appropriate sizing for a nuclear plant in a particular location. But more, more innovatively and more interestingly, using the heat as well, which is these orange arrows. So we looked into several different ways of using the heat and we did an initial report, my team did last, last year, looking at three key um, applications. The first one was um, district heating network. So could you use the heat to, to power, um, to, not power, what's the right word, to uh, fuel, I suppose, district heating in, in the region. And actually, that, that, that's definitely possible. Um, and we, we found quite a, not, not a huge scale in, in, its, in Suffolk, which is obviously relatively, um, relatively a rural area. Um, and then also um, we looked at direct air capture, which is using the heat from the nuclear site to um, remove uh, carbon directly from, from the air. The, um, that I think is a really interesting application of nuclear heat that the Sizewell C team have got, got funding from the government for from Bayes for um, a demonstrator. So they're working through the feasibility at the moment and they'll submit a bid for the demonstrator in the next few months. Um, and then finally, and obviously most relevantly for this, there's the production of hydrogen through solid oxide electrolysis using the heat and the, and the electricity from the, the station. So I think what, what we looked at at, at nuclear, at size C, sorry, is not the kind of the full on um, optimally designed uh, applications that Neil talked about earlier. But what we were trying to look at is how can we start to make these things happen in, in a real project um, with um, a nuclear design that's already very much set well very nearly set in stone because the whole the whole point of size C is that it will be a replica of a pinky point C. Um, it to all intents and purposes, and that's how we will keep the cost down and uh, de-risk the, the, the construction. But even with that, we, we, we found that you could we could tap off a small amount of steam, around 200 megawatts of thermal steam from each reactor, um, to support um, an electrolysis process on the site. 
um, we, we, we definitely concluded that at a, at a first look, there were no showstoppers for that. Clearly, there's a lot to work through in terms of economic and the real detailed safety case, but we definitely see that as something that's possible. So what, what we're looking at now is um, building that capability to tap off the steam in order to, 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 to power any of those three applications or any other applications that we've looked at um, in the future. So I think the, the plan is to adapt the design very slightly to give ourselves that flexibility to, ta to tap off that, that steam. Um, and to, to activate it at some point in the lifetime of the plant. It might be before the end of construction. It might be in 2040 after it's already been operating a few years. But the important thing is by, by building in that flexibility at the construction stage, it'll be relatively straightforward to add a, a heat exchanger and an electrolyzer or direct air capture or whatever the right technology is at that point through the life of the, the plant. And I think the reason we, we see that really important as really important is partly the um, the um, sorry I've lost my train of thought for a minute there is partly that the ability to produce hydrogen at low cost, but also to to give everyone flexibility. So we you know we yeah, we're really pushing forward, for example, trying to um, deploy heat pumps for for the majority of the UK's heating needs. But hydrogen may have a role and we don't need to decide all that today if we build into our plants the ability to um, to make that switch. So to in future have a nuclear plant. Yeah, mostly it will be producing low carbon electricity, but you might also use it for other things. District heating could also play a role in the in the in the energy future. And this plant will be here for a long time. It'll be in operation for 60 years. So the more we can put in this flexibility, the more we can future proof it. Um, so that, that's the kind of the vision of size we'll see. Um, we're also planning to decarbonize the construction by putting a non-heat assisted electrolyzer at size well B to support the decarbonization of the HGBs and the buses on site through hydrogen mobility. Um, so I think just one last point on that and on the kind of the nuclear narrative or two last points. Um, we're also, we don't really want to wait another 10 years before we do our first nuclear hydrogen project um, in terms of using the heat. So we're also looking at what we can do at our existing fleet to do a small scale demonstrator again, a couple of megawatts using solid oxide electrolysis and um, tapping off some heat from those stations. We're hoping to get some support from government for that through the, the hydrogen supply competition. But if we're not successful with, with that bid, we'll, we'll seek another form of form of funding to make something happen and really kickstart this journey. Um, the other another project that we're also looking at at the moment, which is completely off topic, is um, well, not off topic, but um, in a slightly different field, is to what other ways the nuclear industry can support the hydrogen narrative. And we've recently again put together a proposal for storing hydrogen in depleted uranium in, in metal hydride form, which is produced in, in quantity nuclear industry as a waste and is currently um, yeah, a waste product, product that needs to be disposed of. But um, you can react hydrogen with it, form a metal hydride and then use it to um, re and then release the hydrogen at some later date. Um, and so kind of um, solving some of the medium duration storage problems that we have on the system, again, very much thrown into sharp relief by the events of the last couple of weeks. So we're waiting to hear from that. It's quite an exciting technology. It's very energy dense um, volumetrically. So you can store a lot of hydrogen in not very much space. Um, it isn't it is also uh, it's not going to be suitable for aviation or transport. It's quite heavy, obviously. But I think for some for some other applications, it's a really exciting technology that we're really um, really getting quite interested in. Um, how long do I have, Paul? You um, have the, the, uh, three minutes, questions. so I was going to try and get a question in. That's okay. Happy. Okay, I will just talk really quickly then about some of the the end use applications we're, we're doing. Um, so I'll skip over that. So I just wanted to talk really quickly about transport. So we've recently, with Innovate UK support, um, developed a tool called Hyperfleet, which takes in um, all the GPS data from, from a fleet of vehicles, whether that be bin lorries or HGVs or buses. Um, to um, And we, we, we put this through our really quite complicated model, and that, that tells an end user how many of your, your, your vehicles are suitable for, for converting to hydrogen, how much will it cost you? What infrastructure do you need? What refueling do you need? What's the environmental impact of that switch? And most importantly, what's the cost impact of that switch? 
So that's something we've been able to do for electricity, for electric vehicles for a long time, and we're now expanding that to, to hydrogen. Um, and we see that as a really important complement, and it's actually going to be part of our plans for Sizewell C is to use that, that tool. Um, and we've also, we're using that to support um, an application in, in the Midlands. Again, we, we're a part of a pretty large consortium that's looking to produce, I know Sheffield's not quite in the Midlands, but quite close. We're looking to, um, to, to come up with a, a plan for a hydrogen truck demonstrator in the Midlands. So that's a, a large project, again, funded by Innovate UK, that will be um, reaching its conclusion in the next couple of, um, by March, I think. Um, and then we'll look at how we can make that a reality. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up there, because I know I've, I've gone very quickly over the last bit, but um, I just wanted to talk about nuclear, but also really say that it's, the, I don't think any of us can be, be in that pigeonhole. We really all need to look at the, the wider landscape. Brilliant, thank you, Rebecca. That's a really good thank presentation. You I think, yes, thank you. And um, I know that a number of people have got a few questions around here, but we'll hold those off to the panel given the time. We've got one online, though. I'll take that. I think you may have covered it. It's from Naman again, and he said, "Wouldn't solid oxide um, be better than a PEM electrolyzer? I guess, and uh, in comparison, there's a higher efficiency. So I think you've already hinted that that's the way you're going." Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, you have to realise that, that that project was three or four years ago and we wanted to have a, the innovation was the co-location with electrolyzer. So we wanted to have a bet with a nuclear station. So we wanted to have a very established technologies for the, the electrolyzers themselves. And your little glimpse of what you might be doing on metal hydro is that lots of conversations around that. And aerospace could, in some small ways, deal with it. We'll, We'll come on to that another time. I'm okay, sure. oh, maybe I was too dismissive there. But <laughs> forward to uh, an opportunity to, to discuss that further. Yeah, we have been. But look, thank you again, Rebecca. I want to say we'll catch you again in about half an hour at the panel with um, Stephen, who's here in person. I want to make sure that we get to him and then we come back together and, and round out some of the key themes. So uh, with everyone, um, th thumbs up and congratulations for presenting to us in that time. We'll see everyone on the next channel um, for Stephen Cunliffe, who's coming across from Dusan Babcock and here in person. Thank you. Thank you.